Welcome to Liquid Margins. Uh, I'm Franny, I'm gonna be your host and I'm gonna run through a few slides about the show. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Erin Barker. She's going to be uh, moderating today's session. And this is successfully implementing social annotation at your school. Today, we have some wonderful guests, like I said, we have Robin Fauché. She's a service manager, academic experience design and delivery at the University of Washington Information Technology. Eric Hagen, he's the Dean of Online Educational. Uh, I feel like there's a word missing from that, but maybe not. Uh, maybe it's the Dean of Online Education and I mistyped it. So sorry about that. Um, he's at DeSalle University. And then we have Mela Lewandowski. She's an instructional designer at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. And then our moderator today is Erin Barker, and she is our wonderful lead customer service specialist at Hypothesis. I love working with Erin. She's so great. That's my plug for Erin. <laughs> and thank you. With that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Erin. So, Erin, I don't know if you want to share your screen or do you have stuff to share or you don't have to? And by the way, any people on the panel, you could you can share your screen if you do have um, the need to. So Erin, you can handle that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Franny. Uh, I actually don't have a screen to share because I'm hoping we can run this as just a, a conversation about implementing social annotation and hypothesis in the different schools represented here. And what are some kind of best practices for implementing a new tool such as Hypothesis with your instructors and professors? And actually, what are some things to avoid? Uh, so I do wanna kind of give a little bit more of an intro. I am the customer success specialist or the lead customer success specialist for Hypothesis. Uh, and I have worked with each of these wonderful individuals here uh, participating in our discussion today. And there's a reason they get chosen for Liquid Margins. Um, it's because I put a little star next to their names for being fantastic to work with and for being incredible implementers of Hypothesis at their schools. So I'm actually gonna start off, um, those of you who are our attendees, if you wanna walk yourself over to the chat, and tell us where you are at at implementing hypothesis at your school. And I think that will give us some good background to address and give us some good questions, I think, um, and topics. While you're doing that, I want our panelists, Eric, Mela, and Robin, to introduce themselves to you. And because we're on Zoom and it's a bit like the Brady Bunch, um, I'll just call out one of you uh, to get to start. So hopefully you've thought deeply about this. Um, let's start with Robin. And here's what I want you to answer, Robin, is tell us about your role and your school and how you ended up as the one with responsibility for implementing hypothesis at your school. Sounds good. So hi, I'm Robin Fauché. My pronouns are they and she. And uh, as Erin and Brittany let you know, I'm from the University of Washington. So we're a big school. Uh, we have multiple, multiple campuses, lots of different needs when it comes to teaching and learning. And so the group that I'm with, Academic Experience Design and Delivery, uh, is a team of researchers, service owners, service managers. And we basically are constantly trying to check in with campus to see what needs are, um, how the tools that we are currently centrally supporting are filling those needs, and how we can continue to improve experience and fill any gaps that are happening there, right? Um, so even prior to pandemic, we have a really great research group. Uh, I'm gonna call out particularly my colleague, Janice Bournier, who's here today, um, constantly reaching out to the campus to do research, to see how well we're doing with all of those things that we're keeping an eye on. So we knew that we had had some gaps um, and also continuing need around discussion and engagement with students, which I'm sure is not a foreign topic to anyone else who's here in the room today. Um, but we wanted to see how we could provide some more tools to make that work better and to give uh, faculty a, more opportunities to engage with their students in different ways. So we piloted three tools this last academic year, hypothesis being one of them. And I had recently joined the team, but I had also had some experience. Uh, I co-taught uh, a, um, a class 
the previous winter quarter, right as we were getting up to the pandemic. And we had um, my co-instructor and I, Milan Vodakovic, were looking at some tools and trying to figure out how we could show our students uh, in that class who were going to be teachers very, very soon, um, how to implement new technology. So we kind of chose hypothesis at random and had an overwhelmingly positive outcome with that with our students. They were really excited by the tool, really excited to use it with their students as they started to teach. And it actually kind of shocked us. We didn't really expect that sort of overwhelming excitement. And so having seen that with my students and then coming to the team and they were like, oh, we're piloting hypothesis. Would you want to take that up? I was like, 100%. Let's see. Because I was really excited to see the other side of it, like what it actually uh, did with students, what the outcomes were like, and did it have a positive impact on learning outcomes. So. Yeah, that's how I kind of got involved with uh, getting the pilot started or getting the pilot rolling and continuing it through this last year. Well, and Robin, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but when we first started at the University of Washington, it was going to be a very small pilot. And I, I believe that it organically grew. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it was it was very like invite focused uh, the first quarter. And then after the first quarter, we kind of just opened it wide up and we're like, all right, all comers had a banner going on Canvas that we were just kind of taking anyone who was interested. Um, and we had we had good interest in it. I mean, you know, we always have that, all those frictions of, do people have time to pilot? We're in the middle of a pandemic. There's a million things going on. Do people have bandwidth? But we had, we had good reception with it. So that was positive. Eric, what about you? Why don't you talk about your role and how you ended up with the responsibility for piloting Hypothesis at DeSales? Sure. So in this role of Dean of Online Education, I'm responsible for our, I'm in the provost office and I'm responsible for our instructional technology, instructional design and kind of classroom support team, as well as our adult education program. So um, when I, and it's possible that when we started talking to Hypothesis, I might've been directly in charge of the uh, instructional design and instructional tech team. But um, yeah, so we're always looking for ways to enhance our programs. I think when we first, um, we're thinking about hypothesis. It was a real simple objective. It was just, you know, how can we liven up our online classes? We have, you know, several we're a small, the sales university is a small Catholic university with a strong liberal arts tradition. And we have uh, traditional day students, we, as we call them, and also uh, part-time adult undergraduate students and graduate students. And a lot of the adult students and graduate students pre-pandemic were taking online classes. We're always looking for ways to liven them up. And as I saw in the chat, you know, do things that involve human connection, even though they're involving technology. So that was it, you know, do something more exciting than boring discussion boards. Um, but of course the pandemic hit and pretty soon everybody was doing things in hybrid and online mode. So hypothesis became, you know, a lot more attractive to a wider range and pretty much all our student groups at that point. So um, we were glad we were doing some, some things originally because it helped us when we had to transition to more tech-based teaching. And uh, Eric, I would imagine that you have more in-person classes this fall. Yeah, even last fall we had a lot of, uh, we still remained open and we had sort of socially distanced essentially hybrid classes where the classrooms had lower capacities, but this year we're back to full capacity classrooms. But I think, you know, uh, one of the, I guess, positives of the whole experience with the pandemic was because everyone up and down the line are, you know, 130 or so full-time faculty members and, you know, a number more adjuncts all had to engage with technology to some extent. So some of them found there were really great things that they can use to complement their class, even if it's a fully, you know, lecture-based classroom type class. So I think we're going to see more tech adoption and in every kind of class that we have, not just online classes. And one of the things we haven't tried, but I'm be interested if any of the other panelists has, I've never, I don't know that we've had anybody use Hypothesis like in a live class. It's usually been a homework assignment, um, but I'm curious if anybody's tried that. I think, uh, and actually, Eric, in two weeks, is it two weeks, Franny? I'm not sure. Um, we have a liquid margins on using um, hypothesis in a variety of class formats. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. The 27th. Yeah, we'll be calling you, Eric. All right, I got to sign up. <laughs> Mela, what about you? What's your role and um, how did you end up with the responsibility for implementing hypothesis? 
So I'm an instructional designer at the University of Wisconsin at River Falls, and that's part of the larger UW system. Um, and so how did I end up? In part, it was looking at other um, members of the university use in, in our system, because it was a tool that I know that other people were interested in. And then subsequently, or maybe independently, faculty started to come forward and say, do we have this? Can we use this? Is this something that you know, we could add to our to the LTIs to within our, our, our Canvas system. And as an instructional designer, you know, I'm working with faculty for consultation and also for training and 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 so on. And so um, then that's kind of how I became integral to to from the beginning to the end of our piloting that we started uh, this last beginning of this calendar year. And so we kind of worked with the faculty who had come forward for asking and then also I kind of picked some other folks who had been using other social annotation tools or kind of using or, or implementing it as a as a way of, of doing it even face to face um, in groups so um, brought those people in and started a pilot program and got in touch with uh, with y'all and and began the piloting program um, and uh, as we continued through the last semester with people using it um, we kind of surveyed folks in the at the beginning about like what their plan was and then midterm how's it going and then at the end how's it been and now we're we're ready to we've added it to to our to our system and everybody is going to begin using it and we're going to start some more classes for our, our faculty on campus this semester so yeah it that's kind of the the, the steps so now we're going to see every single student at UW River Falls or University of Wisconsin River Falls using it right Mila yeah yes <laughs> Well, I mean, across the curriculum too. So the, you know, I've been working with faculty this summer, you know, and saying, hey, this is, we might have this coming. So um, I'm really excited about, you know, the, the idea of people using it from um, everything from Shakespeare literature, where they're actually going to engage with that old text and using it, which I think will be really interesting. And then also um, just kind of the folks that were in the piloting program, like our animal science folks, like uh, we've had. So uh, just across the curriculum and seeing all the different applications and the potential of it. Um, and I and I think online and and there's like, like you were saying too, is that there's um, in the in the face to face mode too, I think there's some opportunities to be live. And I should just put a plug for our success team that we have lots of ideas for how to implement it in live classes. So feel free to contact our success team or That's your success idea. specialist yeah. who can absolutely help you with that process. Uh, I do want to take a quick second and say, make sure if you are typing in the chat to type to everyone, not just hosts and panelists, um, because I think that will lead to a richer conversation and it is highly likely that someone else also has your question or might be able to answer your question. So please, please make sure when you type in the chat that you switch that little drop down, I believe, to, um, to type in the chat, type to everyone. Yeah, I was like, whoa, I got lost in that question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just wanna jump in to clarify because it used to say all panelists and attendees, Zoom changed that setting unbeknownst to me. So I, in my slide, I said all panelists and attendees, but it, now it says everyone, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the next question, I think um, we should maybe get at some logistical pieces of implementing a pilot at Hypothesis. On my role on the success team um, and in working with schools, oftentimes I work with contacts at schools or um, instructional designers, whoever's running the pilot. Um, and what they want to know is, what are the exact steps I need to take to get this going at my school? So what I'd like to hear from the three of you is what are some specific steps you took to make the pilot successful at your school? And if you wanna boil it down to three steps, that's great. If you wanna elaborate even more, that's fine too. I'm actually gonna go backwards and start with Mela on this one. I actually kind of have a list of eight because I thought about this ahead of time a little bit. You know? <laughs> so. No, boil it down to three. I'm just kidding, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, talking with kind of my support area, because in my area, I mean, you know, I, I'm kind of between, I'm in the provost here, under the provost and then our technologies team. So um, it, initially it was this meeting of, of my local team in the technologies area to say, how do we do this practically? And then communications, you know, with the, with the pilot group. So I kind of, that just kind of came with my responsibility to then, uh, to work with the piloting group, but uh, initially meeting with the hypothesis success team for planning 
um, and just the canvas logistics, like because that's where we were going to be having people access it, and use it, and play with it uh, as a tool uh, within the, their 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 courses or sandboxes or whatever they were working in. Um, you know, of course, determining who's going to be on part of the pilot was a big deal uh, too, to make sure that the people are going to be in it and committed, have the time. You know, are you sure this is something that that works for you at this time? That's kind of thing being sensitive to the faculty. Um, you know, and then scheduling those trainings with them, meeting with them, and then subsequently getting feedback from them, um, you know, in, in any kind of clarity that needed to get going on the on, on in working with the tool. Um, and again, I think I mentioned earlier, kind of surveying them. Um, actually, I surveyed them on their existing knowledge before we even got started. It's like, do you socially annotate? You know, how do you do that? What other tools have you used previously if you have used other tools online? And then how that, you know, thinking about how that might translate in our training for them with a uh, hypothesis. Um, and then after the training, of course, how did the training go and so on? Um, asking them those kinds of questions and serving that, getting that in writing. So I created this table of kind of this, like I, I think about Slinky going down the stairs, you know, it's like, the question and then the subsequent follow-up and what's next. Um, so, uh, and then adding more access to resources in a, in a kind of a digital learning environment, Canvas as a resource for them and then their departments to kind of look at to say what, what are they working on and, it, you know, and just idea development just letting people know that this is what we're doing um even if the even members were not a part of the pilot they could kind of have visibility to it um and then having running a, a this is how i teach uh session with people who finished with the pilot or got through some of the piloting so that they could demonstrate to the folks in their areas that this is a, a tool this is how we're using it um what the potential could be finally at the end is just serving how the tool and 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 um, any recommendations from the faculty? What what more do you need to know? What more, you know? And so, yeah. So in those next steps, when you um, talk about determining who which specific faculty are going to be involved in the pilot, are you finding those faculty yourself, Mela, or did you were those faculty who came to you? Yeah. So it was a combination. So one of the things is it was the people that had already you know had approached and said you know can we get this? Um, there was those folks. Um, then there were, and the, and the, but the majority of the people were people that I kind of looked at from training sessions I had had that I'd worked at, worked with for um, supporting them with teaching online. Um, and so if I saw them as a person who was kind of an early adopter or had been already doing social annotation, either in live classes or using another tool or kind of mentioned their group work, any of those kinds of things were kind of cues for me to think about, you know, this is a pretty good candidate to to be a part of the pilot and those were the those were the folks that I've then reached out to and say do you have the bandwidth for this do you have the time for this to to be a part of this and would you be interested and sent them subsequent you know information from hypothesis to say this is what this tool is, is if you don't know um, and and this is what we're going to try to pilot and um, you know out of all the po folks that I reached out to the only person that there was only one person who couldn't and it was just a time restriction um, everybody was really positive, and I think it's it's good to pick good you know people who are really um, kind of already on doing something that would relate to what hypothesis can augment um, as a as a teaching and learning tool. So, Robin, how about you? How, what are some specific steps that you took? So we had a lot of similarities to uh, what Milo was talking about. So you know, communication a big piece. Uh, reaching out initially to the people that we had had requests from previously uh, that had interests that seemed like the needs that they had expressed uh, either individually or departmentally could be well served by hypothesis. Um, we had a really great email that went out to everyone who, as they joined the pilot, to let them know, you know, here's the getting started information. We pulled a lot of that from the excellent hypothesis resources to help them kind of understand how to get it set up in their course, access it, get their first assignments set up and get going. And um, also that they could reach out to me or to Erin as they were going through the quarter if they needed any techn technical help. Um, and then I think it was, you know, letting them know about resources. We used a Canvas course uh, to provide resources and provide practice areas and continue to populate that throughout the year with the webinar recordings, because uh, we were offering a webinar per quarter, um, gathering feedback. So we were doing a survey with them every quarter to kind of ask, you know, how are things going? How hard is this to adopt? Are you having any technical issues? 
um, is this actually helping you achieve your learning goals? And we had a number of aspects of, you know, how are they engaging with one another? Are they engaging, engaging with the materials uh, to really get some information on that? And then using that feedback to iterate on the materials that we're providing. Because um, we, we saw some things over the, over the year, like, oh, people aren't really understanding that sections and groups are different things and how do we deal with that, right? That's not an issue anymore, but that was something we kind of uh, dealt with this, this year. And even things as simple as, hey, are you remembering to check, uh, open this in a new tab? Because we started, you know, after the first quarter, people were going, oh, I can't see, it's too constrained, right? And you like, you realize all these small things that you're gonna help people with as they're onboarding. So, um, and reporting. So we were creating reports each quarter uh, based on that feedback so that we could really track and have an idea of how the, how the pilot was rolling along and if we were moving towards adoption of this tool. So those were the big pieces. I think the kind of consistent ones just continuing to grow along with the users and figure out how we could best give them the resources they needed to try to be as successful as possible and give us feedback uh, so that we knew if this was a tool we wanted to move forward with. And I don't want to leave Eric out and keep within the time constraints. <laughs> so. Eric, uh, what are some specific steps you took into sales? Yeah, we did some of the same stuff. So um, first of all, the I think the integration with our LMS, which happens to be Blackboard, is pretty pretty easy. I think it's kind of a standard thing. It only probably took a few minutes, really. Um, and since I'm supervising the instructional technology team, you know, it wasn't any problem getting them to do that. Um, then probably the next thing we did it was, you know, the instructional design and technology team and myself, um, especially several of us that teach classes, we became familiar ourselves. And, you know, when we had opportunity to use the tool ourselves, so we were some of the early adopters, but then we tried to find other, you know, well-respected faculty thought leaders to become early adopters as well. And then, you know, we do regular uh, training sessions. And after having some initial training sessions from a hypothesis, we generally like to lead them ourselves because, um, you know, people like to to see the other people from our university leading the sessions, but even better, what we really try to do is get one of those faculty thought leaders to then demonstrate how they're using the tool and have them, you know, talk about it. So, because um, technology ad adoption, I'm sure every place maybe is has this in common, is just difficult to do. Um, there's nothing making people do it; they have to sort of see and becoming in, interested in doing it. Um, so, seeing another faculty member do it is usually the thing that gets them curious rather than the tech person, you know, telling them how great it is. So that kind of works for us. The other thing we do have a, a, a faculty community, but, you know, an organization, they call it within Blackboard, where we keep a lot of documentation about hypothesis for people that want to um, go that go that route. I feel like the three of you who are all our superstar implementers, um, <laughs> Have some common themes here, which is like, the, I think the first one that I have been thinking quite a bit about is this idea of finding specific faculty to pilot the tool first, um, instead of this just general, whoever would like to join can join. Um, and maybe we're not necessarily sending private invitations to those faculty to join a pilot. Um, and I like that idea, and I'm actually on my end, on the success side, going to think more deeply about that and how I can encourage my contacts at different schools to do that. The other thing that I have definitely heard is the providing of resources and updating those resources and growing along with the faculty um, and students as well as they start to use the tool. Um, and we do try to help with that on the hypothesis side. Um, but I know that each of you also expanded that even further on your own side. And then the last one that I like is using the faculty thought leaders to promote or to assist with implementation with other faculty. And Eric, you unmuted, so go ahead. Well, one thing I was thinking about, I think one advantage that Hypothesis has maybe compared to other tools is once people see it, they get it right away. It's not really hard to figure out. I mean, I know there's a lot of magic that makes that happen but you know you see a text you see the annotations you see the you know engagement interaction and you know they get it right away you know some tools are either so general they, they're hard to wrap their mind around or so specific that there's like no wiggle room and you feel like you're stuck in a box so hypothesis seems to be in that sweet spot of you know powerful you can use it different ways but also intuitive at the same time as far as the basic idea of what it's for 
we're recording this and we'll now um, put you as an advertisement. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Mela, you wanted to say something? <laughs> Sorry, it's quite windy. I'm going to shut my window. Um, yeah, so it's, I echo that. I think it's, it's, it's so um, um, amazing that, that what, what comes through with hypothesis in terms of use, user ease is, is that it, it's just the, the pedagogical background of the teachers. I mean, I know that a lot of folks in hypothesis have teaching backgrounds and that comes through in terms of the ease and the facilitation of understanding and the direction of, of using the tool, integrating the tool, um, applications to, to, to use and teaching and learning. So that, that was really, so I wanna echo what Eric said on that. It's, that's really good. Another thing too, I think that is a commonality, I, maybe that we all share is that kind of getting that feedback along that process. One of the things I never wanted my faculty to feel was that they were just hanging out there on their own and they're playing and, and does somebody still care that I'm doing this? You know, and I think, you know, having those regular surveys and getting that feedback, even if they didn't necessarily respond, you know, I'd say, I'm here again and I'm asking these questions. Um, I think that kind of, that may have helped as well as in our process, because it certainly gave me some feedback to think about, you know, what seemed to be a priority, at least for some of the folks as they were responding in the process of the pilot. I would say one, one thing that's, the only thing that's not intuitive about it really is in hypothesis, it's really the interface with Blackboard, and I don't know how it works in Canvas and Brightspace, but the way when you're setting up your assignment, it's like a two-pass thing, and you have to remember not to attach the article, and, um, you know, I wish Blackboard's interface somehow was better, that it could lead them through it, because the ideal thing is something that you just happen upon hypothesis in the menu, and it would just like guide you through the thing. Um, whereas you do have to kind of know, have somebody show you how to do it once, and then it's very simple. I don't know if that makes sense, and I don't know how it works in Canvas and Brightspace and so forth. Yeah, I, I think I was a little bit worried at the beginning that um, so many of our LTIs show up in the in the course menu that people would go, where's hypothesis? I don't see it, right? So the fact that we included that in our onboarding of like, okay, you have to go in and it's a selection in your in your uh, assignments, at, but it really wasn't a problem. It was one of those things that I was kind of like anticipating as a service-minded uh, thinker, but it really didn't turn out to be a problem at all. And most people were, were it was, we knock on wood, uh, have had a pretty good time with getting people on and getting started and it seems like thus far the support burden has been pretty low. Um, this has been with a really small amount of people so I'm kind of hoping that continues through once we roll out uh, university-wide in autumn but yeah it does seem like it's been really user-friendly for both students and faculty so far. And I think with Canvas, I mean, it, with with our the way we have it is, you know, folks can always um, bring hypothesis in through their assignments area, and so it the, it, it you, accessing it is like other LTIs that we have integrated, or not all, but some, many, <laughs> like that are pretty commonly used, and so so subsequently it makes it not such such a, a an issue for our faculty uh, using Canvas. So. And Jeremy put a question in the chat. Some of you may know Jeremy, um, our uh, VP of Education. So, and, and this is specifically from moving from a small pilot to larger implementation across your school, right? So how do you move from piloting hypothesis when generally you have a smaller group, um, as I know for sure we did at University of Washington and also at River Falls, um, and then you move to a subscription to a much larger contract. So what are some of your processes or ideas? And Eric, you might have experience with this because you have moved from pilot to subscription. What are some of your ideas and processes for that? Anyone can answer. <laughs> I'll jump in since we're <laughs> I mean, that, you know, it's a big concern for us. I mean, sort of the, we do have, a small amount of, I don't know if flexibility is the right word, but the fact that um, our tools aren't required, even our centrally uh, supported ones. So everyone doesn't have to use a tool, right? So the idea is like, we're rolling this out university-wide, but we're not expecting everyone at the campus, all three campuses to pick it up and immediately run with it. Um, so I know that it's a big jump from where we were with a pilot, but it's also, you know, still not our full uh, population. But we're kind of doing the same things uh, that we saw work in the pilot, right? We're expanding our documentation. We're just putting that out on our main site now instead of having it housed at a Canvas course. Um, 
we're going to reach out to faculty that participated uh, in the pilot who have already generously shared examples of their use and, and ask for more examples because we can share those and we always know that there's a real desire for that from instructors to see what their peers have done with the tool. Um, and we, you know, we're preparing our support staff, uh, we're working with Hypothesis on support in that way, and I think that we're going to try to think about how we're providing training and resources. That's always, I think, one of the biggest hurdles is how do we provide enough training, um, but doing it so that we're not expecting everyone to devote all their time to come to webinars, right? And actually, we did a really cool thing in spring, and I can't remember if this was Aaron's suggestion or Jeremy's suggestion, but we were in a real big time crunch because we only have a week between winter and spring, and that's, you know, finals, and then spring break, that's grading, and then we're right back into the start of a new quarter. So trying to figure out when we would do a synchronous webinar was really uh, a hurdle. So uh, it was suggested that we try an asynchronous workshop and do it in Hypothesis Magic, right? Um, so Erin provided us with a really great article and a prompt. We put that up in the Canvas course and faculty just dove in there and asked questions and it was really low um, maintenance on our side. I just jumped in every couple of days to check in and mostly answer questions about logistics and, and technical issues where I could provide, you know, some some experience that I've had with the tool so far or uh, links to documentation. And that really, really worked well because it allowed people to participate on, you know, at their pace, on their time that they had to devote to actually training up. So I think that we'll look to do that a little bit more in, um, in the coming year so that we can make it flexible for folks. But that's really kind of the big thing. It's just like expanding on the things that we already learned from the pilot, scaling that up and, um, just trying to, trying to find ways to provide more resources that people can access at their own time and pace. Mela or Eric, you have experience with this, so. Yeah, yeah I, sorry. <laughs> so um, what Robin said, <laughs> um, and <laughs> so I think specific that's going to happen as we're getting ready for our next semester yeah, very soon um, for the in academic year. Um, we're actually running uh, some more trainings, much like the pilot. We're running trainings, but this time we're going to try to integrate like things that I know from the feedback that faculty are really interested in, like, you know, how do I use this with groups? And then subsequently we're training those groups in the group assignments to make them part of the grading, you know, assessment, um, both, well, formative and summative assessments. But so there's so there's that and picking up the themes from the pilot and, and bringing them forward. Also more of the, you know, this is how I teach, I'm hoping with some of my faculty, which I need to talk to you about that. Um, and then um, the other thing is integrating hypothesis more deeply into kind of our qualifications trainings for our faculty to teach online. Um, so there's so that'll definitely be a part of it. And then any of the department um, trainings that I do where I work with a specific department and say, okay, what are some of the things you want to focus on to augment what you're currently doing? Um, hypothesis will definitely be a part of that. Yeah, I think I, I love that say, idea. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, we just, you know, continue to try to uh, talk it up and to get those faculty members that are using it out there to assist us with, you know, sharing their experiences. One thing I wanted to mention before we ran out of time that I got out of, you know, a hypothesis presentation, one of the initial ones that I think is a great starter is that idea of having faculty members annotate the syllabus. Um, I tried that in my own class and I was really amazed at the results because you know, I think most people's experience, you, you have maybe that first or second class where you're kind of going through the syllabus, you know, I know there's different ways to perhaps do that better, but a lot of times it's just kind of routine. And then you say, anybody have any questions? And you know, crickets. But when I had them annotate the syllabus, I got almost more questions than I could possibly answer. So um, those questions were out there. And of course it teaches them how to use hypothesis or familiarizes that, them with it. Um, and you know, you can kind of go from there. So that's a great way to get a specific class up and running with hypothesis, that practice of annotating the syllabus. Yeah, I love that idea. It's also something that I want when faculty are looking at um, uh, the, the, the syllabus, it also informs like what, what, where am I missing information that I could, so that I don't, there won't be that annotation next time. And same thing with, with assignments, I think um, that's really a good one. Another thing too that I have as a resource here is uh, 
in, in Canvas, there's a Canvas resource that I've developed perfectly, much like what, what many schools put on their websites, but this one, they go into Canvas specifically, and I have pages um, set up for specific kinds of tool use, pedagogical approach, and so Hypothesis is one of those pages that, you know, I add information to and will include, you know, liquid margins and, and um, some of the things that we, we were talking about today. Um, the, I think Mela, you were the one or Robin, one of the two about this is how I teach, um, who referenced that one. Uh, Eric, you also referenced a similar concept, just probably I think with a different name. The idea of using faculty to promote or to talk about how they use hypothesis um, in their own courses has been a good one. And I'm on my end, definitely pushing schools to do something similar as much as possible. Um, and then integrating hypothesis into faculty PD sessions just as a tool for them to use to begin with uh, has also been very successful across a variety of schools because if they can use it initially, then they can quickly see the value of a tool like hypothesis. Um, I do want to say also on the annotating the syllabus piece, uh, one thing that I often think about is if you give students the opportunity to annotate the syllabus, you can also see where they feel anxiety. Um, or they feel um, worried about something that might occur in the class or part of the curriculum. And I think while we may not change our syllabus, it's important to note and to see that in our students. Uh, so Jeremy had one question and then I'll end with one last question. And he said, how do you take instructors past the basics to the next level of social annotation? And what does that next level look like? Do you guys need about 30 seconds of think time? <laughs> I'll let whoever would like to answer that jump in. And if you wanna see a visual representation of the question, it's in the chat. One thought that comes to mind with that is taking them from the basics to, to the next steps is to contextualize whatever you're working on with the students for them to their own lives or to current events. And then that can kind of be a springboard to think about how can this annotation, how can the students maybe take on their owning an annotation? For example, if, if there's a particular issue that arises and then they think, you know, this the instructor could ask them to find a resource to, for them to then create as their own annotation in a group that relates to their, like I said, their lives are contextualized in some way. And that sends to, to take to take faculty to the next steps or take the class to the next step in using um, hypothesis in more diverse uh, dynamic ways. So for example, <laughs> so there's, so, so for example, one of the faculty I worked with this summer, we were talking about um, making Shakespeare come to life, taking that old text um, of Shakespeare and and having the students look at that and then think about what's what in the current events or what in their lives relates to that text. And then, then taking that, finding a news piece and bringing that in and then having the students socially annotate on that. And then that's leading to, well, maybe I should turn that into groups. Well, how do I, how do, I do that? How could I make groups be formed and using hypothesis and subsequent for creating and form and so on? Robin or Eric, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I was going to say that um, you know one great thing about hypothesis is I think it leads to more authentic dialogue around around text as opposed to you know kind of box checking behavior. I think that's always something that uh, particularly in online classes, but really any kind of assignment, right? You're you're trying to get people not to go through the motions, but rather to think at a deeper level, and it helps with that. So I think some of the things that uh, Mela was talking about in terms of you know, even simple things like having students bring in their own content, even if it's, you know, in their annotations, even if it's another link or even a meme or just anything where they had to kind of do something um, is great. And then, you know, maybe some of those other ideas like, you know, doing it within groups or having student led sort of annotations. I would think those are all kind of next level activities where you kind of know you're getting there, where you're getting beyond, um, you know, the the discussion board paradigm, not that you can't have good discussion boards, as I saw somebody mentioned in the chat, but um, to more, I don't know, deep and authentic uses of the tool. 
and I'll say when I think about this, it's it's a conversation we've actually been having a lot in the last few days of this, um, when we're trying to take these tools to the next level, right? When we've helped get them onto campus, get them set up, make sure they're running, make sure making sure we're being responsive is it gives us a really great chance to collaborate with our partners on campus, right? So thinking about the UW libraries have been um, piling press books and there's annotation in press books. So how can you get students involved with actually creating content in the class that's generated as a group and then maybe annotating that, uh, working with our Center for Teaching and Learning um, and thinking about how they work with faculty and that they've, are, they've been doing a lot of DEI work this year and how does that tie in with that? Could we be using this tool as a support for that? Could we be tying those goals into how people are annotating in their classes and what sort of environment uh, that's creating for collaboration and engagement? So yeah, I think for us, it's just, we don't expect to be bringing faculty to that level alone. We're looking to like faculty to partner with, uh, partner divisions on campus to really help us get to that next place and help everyone use the tool in the ways that's helping them uh, achieve the, the goals that they're, they're really looking to meet. So I wish I had attended universities that all of you work at. <laughs> um, I did go to a very wonderful university, but I, I feel like uh, teaching and learning has certainly changed in the past few decades since I've graduated from undergrad. Um, I'm gonna give you a last question and then I'm gonna give you some time to think about it uh, and take a look at the chat and we'll come back to the last question. So. The last question is this, what is one piece of advice, just one, Mela, um, that you would give <laughs> to a school who is just starting to implement hypothesis? So think about that. Everyone else who's attending today, this is your chance to, again, walk yourself over to the chat and get in your last questions for any of our experts here on this panel. Uh, so take yourself over to the chat, get in your questions, um, and even if they're just general hypothesis questions, we'll have our hypothesis team answer those as well. Erin, if I can just jump in for a second, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, we are, we are uh, at the closing out time. I just want to make sure that if, if the panelists can stay for a bit more time, that would be great. We would love that. If you have to go, totally understand, same to the people. Uh, who are attending today in the chat. Thank you. All right. So you had your think time, sort of. Uh, one piece of advice you would give to a school who is just starting to implement hypothesis. And Robin, you get the first word this time. You're so mean. You know me. I like to be verbose. So um, <laughs> what would I say? I think the thing that came to mind the first thing that came to mind is understand, like know what your success metrics are, right? Um, and I think for us, like really thinking about our surveys helped us do that. Like, why were we bringing this in to look at? What were we hoping this was gonna help faculty with? And that really helped us understand what we wanted to ask about so that we could track that through the year. But I think that, you know, it's the, the sharper you have that in focus of what you're really trying to complement, you know, how you're trying to complement other tools that exist, what you're trying to help faculty with. I think that helps you understand better how to help them and how to onboard the tool and also to think about what you're looking for in your decision to adopt or not at the end of the pilot, so. Excellent, Eric? I would say that, um, again, something that Hypothesis itself models in its own training is trying to get people to do something. Um, so, you know, we've certainly run training over time in various subjects where, you know, it's a webinar, people go to the webinar, they watch the webinar, and then they forget about the webinar. So I think incorporating getting your hands dirty with it a little bit um, is good. So like Hypothesis does when you typically go through training, they will have you actually annotate an article. And, you know, we try to take it to the next step, you know, as far as faculty and have them actually set up you know, a hypothesis assignment in our learning management system. So they've done it once and you kind of get over that hump of how do you get this technology uh, adopted? So, you know, learn by doing, I guess, not rocket science, but uh, something good that hypothesis models and we're trying to do more of at our university. Agreed, I've been to many webinars in my life where <laughs> I don't have to do anything. <laughs> Uh, Mela, you get the last word. Okay, one thing. Hmm. 
So I think after determining what the pilot members really are looking for after surveying them, connecting hypothesis support materials in a, a customized way as much as possible so that they can be, it's really, so it's really targeted what, what, what support they need. And I don't mean like tech help alone, like all the great stuff that's out there that, that speaks to kind of their desire and then consulting with them afterwards, like helping them interpret if needed for application. That was fabulous. And I will say as the lead customer success specialist at Hypothesis, I now have four pages of notes for things that I learned in today's session. So thank you. <laughs> and I'm gonna turn it back over to Franny. So I am just, again, so pleased um, with this discussion today. It's been really great. It went by so quickly um, as these things often do. And thank you for staying over a little bit. And um, thanks for everyone for attending today. Again, um, you will get a recording of this um, and as will um, your colleagues who registered but could not attend today. So everyone who registered will get a uh, copy of the recording. And um, if there's anything else you would like, um, such as the chat, again, you can email me directly. And um, yeah, thank you for being here today. And we'll see you next time on Liquid Margins.